Okay. Thursday afternoon. I can't believe it's Thursday already. This is uh, Comics Camp 2020, MerrickBennett.com, Patreon.com slash Merrick Bennett. And we are live inking today. So let's see, I have my clipboard out. I can put my pencil aside because I penciled out a page here. We're using our, our pie process, penciling, then inking, then erasing a page and proofreading before we ink. So I have a basic page. Actually, this is two pages here. So this is gonna be the wraparound cover of a mini. It might be half size, so I'm drawing pretty big, um, but there's a lot of information to share here. So this is going to a, um, I'll do the back cover first, so I'm not working over my inking, and then I'll do the front cover. This is gonna be the wraparound cover to a poetry comic that I posted to the Patreon earlier this week. It's a uh, colonial history poetry comic. I'm just gonna trace over these pencil lines, lay down some ink so you can see what this, um, so you can see the story, the basic information. Hopefully it'll be eye-catching, but this is a pretty dense informational page because there's a lot to share here. So let's see, there's gonna be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven boxes, eight boxes, really a smaller box here. Um, and this, so let's ink in the boxes. I'm thinking of these as boxes more than panels because this is like just compartmentalizing some information. So if you wanna refer to it, you can. This is a not so much storytelling here. Now I'm using the thick side of the chisel tip to do those tier in inter-tier lines. So top tier is together, but this is two boxes. I'm gonna use the thin side of the chisel tip to divide those. My thinking is it's gonna be hard for your eye to move, harder for the eye to move through a thick line than it is through a thin line. So you're more likely to read across and those lines won't quite line up just perfectly, which also makes you more likely to read across because those line up. Actually, there's another box squeezed in there and this will be the final box right there, okay. So I planned this all out with pencil. We'll see how well it fits. I think I'll stick with the marker for this first panel. So this is the back cover of the whole book. It's gonna be about, uh, it's, I think it's gonna be eight pages. So this, remember, represents two of those eight pages. So the story is gonna happen in the six pages that go between this. I'm not gonna draw on this side, obviously, because the ink is coming through. So I'm just drawing on one side here. Use that pointy chisel tip about, I can see this is a little thick for this box, so I'll switch to a thin line for a middle word like the an article, um, about the poet. So this is where I'm gonna give some historical information about the, uh, the, the person who wrote the poem that this book presents, interprets as a comic. If you look her up in the records, You'll want to look up Lucy Terry Prince. But apparently, in the sources I was reading, she actually called herself. That's not what she called herself. She called herself Luce Bija. And we'll see why in a moment. All right, but I think I'll stick with Lucy Terry Prince for the title of this because if you're looking her up and wanna know more, that's the name that she's under from what I can tell. All right, let me switch to the thin line pen, but I'm still gonna write as large as I can to fit into these boxes. So first data point. Luce Bija, or Lucy Terry Prince, was born in Africa, 1730. Let's put the, let's put the years in uh, bold so they're easy to find here. 
And I started out, I was drawing, I was trying to draw like a, a little baby. And then I was thinking, what, what did that look like? Was she swaddled? Was she dressed? Was she not? What was the situation of her birth and her family? I have no idea. And I couldn't find information about that. Nothing conclusive, historically conclusive. So then I decided these two panels are going to go together. So then I decided I'm just going to show an ocean because she actually lives most of her life in Massachusetts and Vermont, uh, right near me. So I'm going to show an ocean. I'm going to show a coastline. I'm not sure what this coastline looked like. So I'm just going to maybe make some, I don't know, some trees or something. I hope there were trees there. I could be totally off base, but I got to draw something, show something. So a coastline across the ocean. Next panel. And if you can still see the pencil lines here, you know, of course, I'm going to come in and erase them once I've done the whole book, uh, the whole page. I'll pencil ink and erase my artwork. So I'll clean that up afterwards. I kind of like the space around these words. I, Like I said, I want to make the words as big as possible, but I don't want to pack them in and make it impossible to read. So a couple of these are pretty densely packed but I'm gonna to try to keep some space around those words. It helps your eye. Now, as far as we can tell, as far as researchers can tell, Lucy Terry Prince was born in Africa and sold into slavery in Rhode Island as a baby, as a child, young, young child. And they can't track down which ship she came on or exactly when, but there are instances of young, young kids coming in in the slave trade in Rhode Island. There was a, a big slave trade. The, um, the Brown family was involved in it. A lot of merchants were involved in it. A lot of people in New England benefited from it, at least financially, definitely not spiritually. So I'm thinking sort of a dark, ominous slave ship coming in across the water. And, you know, I, I went to school in Providence, so I'm going to sort of draw um, some buildings. And I'm thinking of the hill in Providence. The city at that time was right at the base of the hill. And the ships came right in up to the, the wharves there. So maybe that's Rhode Island right there. I don't think I need any more detail than that, and I can't fit any more detail than that in. All right. Oh, look at that. You put one detail in, you kind of want to add another, but let's keep it as simple as possible. All right, next data point. Lucy Terry Prince. grows up. Um, she actually, they think, is in Connecticut as a kid. The name Terry um, may be the name of somebody who bought her in Rhode Island or from Rhode Island, took her to Connecticut. The Terry family owned slaves, apparently, in Connecticut. Um, but by the time she's an adult, she's owned under the system of slavery in New England enslaved by a man named Ebenezer Wells. He's an, in, uh, an innkeeper of Deerfield, Massachusetts. And these stories are, uh, these are surprising to people. A lot of New Englanders grow up just believing that there wasn't slavery in New England. Slavery is something down South. We didn't have it in New England. A lot of our, uh, a lot of the books I read in school as a, as a student, um, as a Jew, mass, uh, see, this is my trouble of talking and writing at the same time. Focus, focus. Mass, uh, Chu sets. I can fix that later with a little piece of paper, <laughs> fix that letter. Um, 1730s to the 1750s. That's where she is. And I think what I'll do is I'll draw, I don't know what Ebenezer Wells is in looked like, but I can draw just a building that'll stand in for an inn. 
maybe like a door, some windows, and I'll write in on it. This is the trick to um, drawing history comics is, especially in the early colonial era, there are no photographs, there are no pictures of a lot of people and places. Um, you can do lots and lots of research to try to track down what the inn may have looked like in Deerfield, Mass in the 1740s and 50s, but oh my goodness, you might not find that. And I have to decide as a cartoonist, you know, how much, how many hours do I want to devote to figuring out what the slave ships in Rhode Island may have looked like? And, and then the trade-off here is if I draw it quickly and you just see a sailing ship and we get that idea, maybe that's enough. What I really want to focus on is this narrative of Lucy Terry Prince's life, right? And that's partly why I didn't draw her as a baby. I'm not trying to draw her as a kid or an adult because I have no idea what she looked like. All I know is her names, uh, these points that other his that historians have looked up and verified, um, and some of the guesses people have made. We also know this is why this whole comic comes about. Lucy Terry Prince, first Lucy Terry, I think Lucy Terry Prince, I wonder when she was named that. This woman named Lucy, who's living in Deerfield, enslaved by the Wells family, one of two slaves working that in. She composes the first known, maybe I'll put known in parentheses because that's important to highlight. Um, the first known poem by an African-American woman. I like to put in known there because there very well could have been and probably were poems, lots of poems by women in these situations. African-American woman. Um, but this is the first one that is recorded. And, and it's really cool. This is partly why I'm so interested in it. It's recorded. The poem is called Bar's Fight. And it's an oral history poem. So she recited it. I think she could write. I think she could read and write. She was in the church in Deerfield. She may have learned through the church how to read and write. Um, but she recited poetry. And people would come to her and say, hey, say that poem about the Bars fight of 1746. Now the Bars, let me draw a rifle. I know that there were rifles or not rifles, muskets involved and tomahawks involved because the Bars were a, um, a stretch of meadows, I think with a kind of fence across it, the Bar. Um, and the people of Deerfield went out into the Bars and at one point in 1746, at several points, but at, in 1746, there was an, an Indian raid on town. Um, and, and that's what this book will be. There will be six pages recording, um, interpreting her poem in comics. That's what I'm working on now. I actually have those pages here, a bunch of different drafts of them um, and different ways to draw them. And it's, oh, it's such a fascinating poem. Um, but that will be another day. We'll share that another day. This is just the cover here, live inking. So she um, composes this poem, and because she composes it about this Indian raid, it's really famous, at least in town. People want to hear it. The poem persists in oral history for over 100 years until it's written down in 1855. That's my source, is the 1855 History of Western Massachusetts by a guy named Holland. And uh, we get the poem from that. And he says, oh, here's an oral poem by, uh, an oral history poem by um, Lucy Terry Prince of Deerfield. And he gives a little of her story and she's in the history because of that. Yeah, it's, uh, thanks Donna. Yeah, it's so cool to know that, um, that this was her way of staying in the history. I'm gonna post, uh, I think coming through to the, on the comments should be a source link to my Patreon that should, contain some links to um, David R. Proper's article on this and the Holland book of 1855. People have written a lot and done a lot of research on her. So 10 years later, um, she marries Abijah Prince, who is a free African-American man who was in the area. Um, and I think he's like 20 years her senior, but she marries him and she calls herself Luce Bijah or Bijah's Luce, right? And that's Abijah. She's Baija's Luce. So that was the name she used for herself. She, I guess, did not use her.
her slave owners' names, her enslavers' names. Um, they live in Deerfield for a while, and she recites her poem. Then by 1785, they appear as free landowners. So she got free. Maybe he bought her freedom. Maybe some other thing happened. Maybe Ebenezer Wells manumitted her. Who knows? I, I don't know. Somebody may know. Um, they're free landowners in Vermont in 1785. That's the next point. This is a very condensed biography. Clearly, it's one person's uh, one person's life. From what I can tell, it's like the high points of my reading as a cartoonist doing quick research on this person whose poem I'm drawing, right? So I want to draw her poem. I have to understand what her life was like. And this is my way of sharing with you, the reader, a little bit of it. So the other, this just blows my mind. This is just the high points as I see them. But there's this amazing fact about her. We know it's a historical fact because it occurs several times uh, from several sources and they all kind of agree. She successfully argues, am I using present tense or past tense? Composed, married, past tense. Okay. She successfully argued her own case in a land dispute in Vermont against a neighbor who was apparently trying to like cheat her and her husband out of their land, out of the deed of their land. I don't quite understand it, but it went to, um, it went to court and her opponent, the guy trying to cheat them out of their land, uh, hired these high priced um, fancy lawyers who I think were later like Vermont Supreme Court justices and stuff. And at the time it goes to court and a US Supreme Court justice is sitting on the bench. Um, I'm blanking on the name. I'd have to go check in, in David Proper's article. Um, but at that time, I didn't realize this, the US Supreme Court justices, it was like you didn't sit in Washington at some building, you know, in robes somewhere. You actually were on a circuit court mission. You would travel around the country as a Supreme Court justice and you would sit in all the different district courts. I may have this not quite right, but the, this is basically how it worked. You would sit and hear cases in all these different district courts. So here I am gonna draw um, Lucy Prince. I'm gonna give her just dark hair and maybe, uh, maybe I'll take a thin pen and just do some gray lines to darken her skin to recognize her African heritage. I don't know how she dressed. I'll just give her like my little stick figure 19th century dress. Uh, sorry, this is 1796. So it's 18th century. I'm really scrunched for room by this point. And let's put her hand up. She may have worn a kerchief or a hat or something, I don't know. But as an African-American woman, she successfully argues her own case before a US Supreme Court justice who's sitting in Vermont, in the Vermont um, court. And there's some debate, I guess, among some people, whether she was actually arguing in the US Supreme Court because of that effectively, or if she was arguing in like the Vermont Supreme Court or what it was, or, you, or whether it was just US Circus Court. Circus circuit court, circuit court. So I, I put it as she argued her own case before US Supreme Court justice, uh, one of the justices who was sitting, which is just amazing. I think she argued twice and, and there's several cases where she, um, she gave these addresses. She was quite an orator. So the fact that her only poem that survived is Bar's Fight, I don't know. I, I kind of suspect there were lots and lots of poems by Luspeja. And maybe they just didn't get written down. This is this is like part of the legacy, I think, of slavery in New England, of people who weren't considered part of these towns of New England, because, you know, there's no slavery in New England. That was kind of written out of the history in the generations after this. So the fact that her poem gets into the, into the written record by the 1800s, 
She survives into the 1800s. She argues her own case. She stands up and her voice, you know, can't be ignored. Um, it's really amazing. I, I see her as, in a way, you know, her own life, of course, on its own merits, I see, but I also see her as a symbol or a, a hint at the many, many other people who, like her, helped kind of build these towns in New England and witnessed all this history. She dies in Sunderland, Vermont, July 11th, 1821. And her obituary appears in the papers at a time when women's obituaries didn't appear, let alone African-American freed, freed women. Um, so quite a, quite a life history. I'm going to add in here, um, because I want people to know I'm not just making this up, I'm really scrunched for space. So I'm going to add here, source. And I got a lot of information from a great article by David R. Proper. I guess he's the unofficial historian of Cheshire County, New Hampshire. Um, and his article is Lucy Terry Prince, singer of history. I love that idea of somebody who sings history. I, as someone who, you know, cartoons historical stories, <laughs> amazing to think of that. So I'll scan this in. I'll shrink it down. That'll be the back cover of our book. The front cover is going to be um, a little simpler because, like I said, I, I don't really have any photos of the people involved. I don't have any paintings of them. So I'm really using very simple stick figures. I'm thinking it'll just be the title of the poem here. Bars, the bars being those meadows outside of Colonial Deerfield, Massachusetts. So we'll just put a big title up there. You need a title on your cover of your mini comic. You need a title, you need an image, and you need the author or author's name or names. So that's good. I might, I might black those in if I want the words nice and bold. Um, Best thing I can think of to put in here for an image is it was haying time. August was the 25th, 1746. The Indians did an ambush lay some very valiant men to slay. That's the first line of Barr's fight. Good way to memorize poetry is to uh, draw it out as a comic because <laughs> I find I have in my head the uh, I find I have in my head each line in its own box, in its own panel. I'm just really roughly cartooning a musket here. Don't know exactly what the muskets look like. I should probably do a little research, but it's a cartoon. Um, so I think the the pitchforks, the or the haying forks, at least uh, the haying tools, are one symbol of this scene, the hay itself. Maybe it's sort of down on the ground here. Probably size and things like that would also be good symbols of this. The musket and the pitchfork. Because this was a, a haying party out in the meadows, bringing in the hay to feed the livestock over the winter. Survival depended on it. They go out and the Native Americans, who's land it had been not so long ago, um, raid the town, raid the meadows. And a bunch of, um, and what Lucy Terry Prince's poem does is it documents the fates of each of the victims or the people who um, were captivated, taken away, kidnapped by the Native American raiding party. And that's where it gets really interesting because Lucy Terry Prince, remember, was born in Africa and kidnapped and stolen into slavery in the United States. So here she is as a effectively an enslaved person in colonial New England witnessing kidnapping by Native Americans. And this was actually not unheard of. It's amazing how many towns, when you go looking for it, how many towns have a history of slavery 
And sometimes that history intersects with Native American raids on the towns um, or defensive moves by the Native Americans in the different wars. Let's see, poem by, I think I'll go with the, I think I'll go with the thick marker for the names. Like I was reading in the history of Canterbury, New Hampshire, not so far from here. Um, a lot of the town land was cleared by enslaved labor. And if an, if an Indian raiding party came by and was gonna kidnap you up to Canada, you as an enslaved person would have to decide, well, do I wanna stay here in slavery or do I wanna take my chances with these people who are gonna take me to Canada? Really fascinating decision to make. Art by yours truly, Merrick Bennett. I will, of course, fit my website somewhere on this cover, but that's going to be the basic cover. So that'll be the front cover there. Bars fight, try to keep it clean, symbolic in a way, because I don't know what the people look like. I'll just focus on symbols. And on the back, focus on the data points from Lucy Terry Prince's life. If it looks like I'm drawing too close to the page, it's because I am. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna scan this on my own and I will resize it and fit it onto the page. So there's a little more safety zone around that edge. And then I will work on um, finalizing the artwork here for the poem and I'll get that in there. And I'll be posting the whole mini to, um, well, it'll probably show up on MerrickBennett.com, but check out the Patreon slash Merrick Bennett patreon.com slash Merrick Bennett. You can become a patron there and um, you'll get all the source links and all the drafts and you'll see all the, the struggles and all the joys of drawing history comics. I'm not gonna draw on the reverse of this because that ink comes right through. So one side only. You know, the last step of course in our pie process, penciling, proofreading, inking and erasing. So now I'm gonna take a few minutes to gently go through here and clean up all that artwork, then it's ready for scanning. I'm gonna pop back on probably this afternoon and do some scanning um, on this project or a different project. So keep an eye out for that. Um, we're doing a lot here at Comics Camp, a lot of, lot of cool stuff going on. Um, and I look forward to seeing your comics. Thanks for stopping in everybody. Um, oh, we got some questions here. I, I haven't been looking at the comments. I'm sorry if I'm ignoring your comments. Um, Felicia Martin says, Wow, I've never heard of her. I grew up in Western Mass near De Deerfield. I know. Well, that's that's what I've been looking at, Felicia. Um, I'll show you one other thing. We all have to do this work, right? It, it, now in the days of Black Lives Matter and raising people's consciousness of this, we, we have to do this work locally. Um, I, I really believe that. And I've been hearing that from so many different activists. Go to your own town, go to the place where you were born and look for evidence of slavery or racism in the United States, at least it's all over the place. If you grew up near Deer Deerfield and you never heard of Lucy Terry Prince, my gosh, there's so many reasons for that, right? Um, and what is this identity of New England that we have? I go in my own town. I was just over in the graveyard the other day. And, um, and there's sort of this myth that slavery was not in New Hampshire, was not in Henniker, New Hampshire, where I grew up. I must have walked by this or bike rode by this gravestone a thousand times or thousands of times in my life, literally thousands of times, never stopped to read it and realize, wait a minute, there was a hundred year old veteran of the Revolutionary War living in my town as late as 1836, almost within a couple years of the birth of Freeman Colby, right? So Freeman Colby is born in 1840. He never got to meet Jeremiah Crocker. He grew up in a town where he didn't get to see uh, an African-American Revolutionary War veteran. That sort of changed his sense of who his town was. And that changes how he, and by extension, I and, and my readers, view race in the Civil War and, and the stories that he tells around that, right? So this stuff, like it, it just follows her story and her vision and her voice just follows right through till today. And it's in every town. People's voices and stories are there. We just have to go looking for it, right? We have to find these stories and bring them out. So yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm glad to hear, I'm not glad to hear you haven't heard of her, but I'm glad that we're bringing some new stories to people's awareness. Um, 
And uh, High Taylor was Lucy Prince still enslaved when she wrote this poem. If she, as far as I know, um, I would say go back to the David R. Proper article, um, which I'll, I'll post a link to that. And it's on the Patreon too. I posted a couple sources on my Patreon. Um, as far as I know, and I kind of drew it in here, she was still enslaved in 1746. I believe she was not free. At least she's on the census or, or uh, not the census, sorry. She's listed as a free landowner with her husband in 1785 in Vermont. That might be the first time she's officially listed as free, but I bet David Proper has some stuff to say. I think she was free by the time she married Abijah Prince. I think that her freedom was tied up in that somehow. There are actually church records in Deerfield um, that, that we could go look up and, and uh, answer that. Good question. Um, and uh, hi to the family, Taylor. <laughs> nice to see you out here. Um, and Donna, Thanks, I just joined your Patreon. Oh, thanks so much, Donna. That's what makes this possible to, to do these videos and make them public. Um, I'm doing this just on my own time, basically, and I'm doing research on all these stories and uh, people going in and joining that Patreon and becoming a, a member there at any level just really helps. And also, um, please feel free to spread the word and share all these videos. I'm gonna be working on this all month um, and then into the fall. and who knows, for the rest of our lives, we're gonna be working on this stuff. Um, amazing history, very, very many, many thanks to um, uh, Chantilly Gander and the Vermont Humanities folks for bringing my attention to Barr's fight. I'm just new to this story. I'm getting a sense of it by drawing it. So um, this has been an education for me and there's a lot of scholarship and research and um, presentation and performance that has gone into this. Um, so thank you to everybody who's whose work I'm benefiting from. All right, I'm gonna go erase, scan this in, and then I'm gonna put the mini together. Um, and hopefully we will see you soon, everybody. Have a wonderful Thursday. Um, and signing out at Comics Camp headquarters. This